All right, go ahead and go to Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 16 tonight. We're, um, I encourage you when you, get it, uh, when you go home tonight or sometime this week when you get a chance, read the entire chapter of Ezekiel chapter 16. We're not going to take time to do that tonight. But Ezekiel chapter 16, it's, a very, it's actually a very graphic uh, passage of Scripture. God is trying here in Ezekiel chapter 16 to explain to Jerusalem uh, just how wicked they have been. And, I mean, he is, he's gives some pretty disgusting details. It says in verse 1, we'll read a little bit of it, but it says in verse 1, Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. And so, he starts out here in verse 3, he says, and thus, say, thus saith the Lord God of Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, and thy mother an Hittite. And for, as for thy nativity, in the day that thou was born, thy navel was not cut, neither wast thou washed in water to supple thee, thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. None I pitied thee to do any of these unto thee to have compassion on thee. But thou wast cast out in an open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou wast born. God basically compares them that the way he found them, it was like a baby who's been born and just taken and cast aside you know, the navel's not cut the cord not cut i mean still covered and everything i mean you can imagine you know you ladies have had babies and everything what that would be like and kind of like some of these you know drugged up girls that'll go and have babies at these you know dances and things and just throw it in a trash can and we've heard those stories before where they you know they found babies in dumpsters and things like that and it's a it's a sad uh it's a disgusting situation when you, you know, to think of that and to see something like that. And God's describing Israel this way. And then he goes on to, in the rest of the chapter, and then he, you know, he gets pretty graphic just explaining how basically they were just a, like a very uh, whorish woman as far as the way they, uh, they were unfaithful to God. And it gets, it, you know, it gets really graphic. And so I, and I encourage you to read it. We don't have time to go through all of it. But the part I want us to focus on, jump down to verse 47. And it says, Yet hast thou not walked after their ways, nor done after their abominations. But as it were a very little thing, thou was corrupted more than they and all thy ways. Talking about Sodom and her daughters. As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters, as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. So right there, we see God, he com he's comparing them to Sodom. He's saying, they're your sister. And what you've done is worse than what they've done. And I think one of the reasons he's saying that too, you know, Sodom, they never had a witness there other than guys like Lot who didn't do his job. You know, but God, he had blessed Jerusalem. God had given them his law. He had sent them the prophets. He did one thing after another for them. You know, he delivered them out of the hands of their enemies. Where Sodom, you know, they were always being defeated by their enemies. And, uh, you know, and th this isn't going to be a Sodom bash or a Sodomite bash tonight, but I just can't resist. Sodom was always defeated by their enemies. And that's another great reason why we don't want them in the military, all right? They get beat all the time. And you remember, you know, they, they had those kings come after them. They all got defeated. Then Abraham came along and took care of them. You know, took care of the armies that they couldn't handle. But that's another message for another day. But I, I just couldn't pass that one up. But so he is, he's trying to show them how bad they are. And obviously, you know, he's doing this because Jerusalem, they don't realize how wicked they are. You know, many times when people are wicked when they're backslidden, you know, it, it's such a slow process, they don't realize it's bad. It's just like that person who stinks really bad. You go to that house that smells horrible. You know, it didn't get that smelly overnight. It was a slow process, and so they don't even notice it. There was a guy who used to go, go to my dad's church, used to ride the bus, and I'm not, that house smelled so bad that every time I'd go there, we'd go visit, and I'd go knock on the door, I would just wait for it when he would open the door, and you could literally feel the smell. I mean, you could almost see it come out of the room as he would open the door. I'm not exaggerating. And the house was always just full of empty Bubba Coke bottles. You know, you get those big, like, three-liter bottles of Bubba Cola and just, like, 
chug them right there. It was just disgusting. You know, you have bags of Cheetos all over the place. And I, you know, if I think of that when I eat Cheetos, I have to quit eating the Cheetos. You know, it was just smelly house, smelled horrible. Well, he moved to a new house. He ended up getting a new house. And I remember I went there and I visited and the house didn't stink. And I was just like, wow, you know, this is, this is kind of strange. And it was a few months later, I went there and I visited again and it smelled just like that other house did at one time. I mean, just horrible. And you think, how can people live this way? Well, it's a gradual thing. And Israel, they're horrible. They don't realize they're as bad as they are. And you know what? I think we can apply what we're, what we're going to see here. He talks about the iniquity of Sodom, what it was that got them in trouble. And he's comparing that with Israel. And I think we can look at things in America today and even in the lives of, you know, even in churches and amongst Christians. And we can see where in many ways we're just like Israel was. And just like Sodom was, we can kind of see how they got there. But we don't, Christians, they often don't see themselves, you know, as wicked. We don't see ourselves as wicked as Israel. But, you know, even in Revelation, in Revelation chapter 3, if you want to turn over there, when he's talking to the Laodicean church, he, he says in verse 15, I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of thy mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with good goods and have need of nothing. These people in the church thought they were pretty good. They saw themselves as fine, but look at how Jesus saw them. He said, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Y'all see that? God saw that church way different than they saw themselves. Israel didn't see themselves that wicked, but God saw them as much more wicked uh, than they did. And when, you know, when we think about the city of Sodom, what is it we automatically think about? We think about perversion, don't we? We think about sodomites. We think about homosexuality. That's the main thing we think about. And the main, and it's the main thing that's highlighted in Genesis. When you read Genesis and you read about the men of Sodom, you know, the first time it's mentioned, you know, the men of Sodom are wicked exceedingly, but the, but Genesis doesn't tell us how Sodom got to where it was. It, it, does, it doesn't tell us that. But here in Ezekiel, it does tell us. <clears throat> sorry, I got a frog in my throat tonight. It does tell us how Sodom got to where it is. And many people too, uh, you know, a lot of your, you know, more easygoing Christians, one of the, this passage here in Ezekiel is a passage that they will use as an excuse to go soft on the Sodomites. Because, you know, like, you know, what do you all, when you all think of Sodom, what do you all think? You all think about, you know, the homosexuality, the perversion. Well, let me tell you something. You know, that's not the worst thing that went on there. You know, let's look at how God sees things. Let's look at how God sees it. And look at the first thing that God says about Sodom. He says, pride. You know, who are you to be bashing Sodomites when you've got pride in your heart? And then they'll make it like, you know, we need to go easy on them. And after we fix our pride and all our other things, then we can preach against that stuff. But listen, I don't believe this passage right here is listing these iniquities in the order of worst to the least because the abominations is mentioned last. I believe what we're seeing here in Ezekiel is he is making, he's showing a progression. Okay, People don't just become sodomites overnight. They're not just born that way. That, that is not how it happens. All right. You know, I, I know if you watch a lot of TV and a lot, watch a lot of news, you probably think that way, but it's just not true. It doesn't happen that way. And, the, and so, you know, God, he didn't list these in the order of importance, but I believe he listed them in the order of how they happened. And, it, and he's showing a progression here. And listen, it's crystal clear in life. One sin usually leads to another sin. And so let's look at some of these things, this progression, because I believe we've already seen this in American history. And I think we also see this type of thing too, you know, not just in nations, but I think if you're not careful, we can see this in our church. And I think you can even see it in your own personal life if you're not careful. And so the first thing he mentions is pride. This was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. This is what got them in trouble. And he says, pride. Okay, and what's another thing Sodom is known for? It's known for being destroyed. And what is it that it says in Proverbs 16, verse 18? Pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. 
Pride is something that it is. It's going to lead to destruction. And what is, what, what is, I think one of the things that has got us in trouble in America, okay, is our national pride. Listen, I know, you know, music has an effect, all right? And I'm just going to be honest. When I hear songs like Proud to Be an American, you know, I don't know. It just, it does something. I think that's brainwashing. Because when I actually stop and think about America, I'm like, you know, I'm not that proud. <laughs> you know, and it's, uh, you know, I think we've got a lot to be ashamed for. But you know what? I sometimes think our national pride, I know our national pride has got us in trouble. Listen, there was a time when, you know, people did, you know, they recognized the authority of the Bible. They recognized God in this country. But somewhere along the lines, we got all oh, proud to be American, proud to be American. Instead of, I'm thankful that I'm an American. I thank God for the country he's given us. I thank God for the freedom that he's allowed to have. Somewhere along the lines, we quit praising God for the country we have. At one time, it wasn't that way. Why do you think it's on our money in God we trust? Because there was a time in God we trusted. There was a time when it was considered one nation under God. There was a time that people thought that way, people felt that way, that that was the mentality in America that we have what we have because of God, that we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. We realize that our rights, they don't come from the government, they come from our Creator. We understood that God was the authority, and therefore and God was the focal point, but somewhere along the lines, and I, I think when it happened was when you know God greatly blessed our country i mean god has been good to this country this is a you know this has been a great country it is a very blessed country it's very prosperous but somewhere along the lines it turned into pride and we are we're proud to be americans why because we have freedom well wait a minute didn't our freedom come from god so why would we why would we have pride in that you know i'm thankful that i'm a christian but you know what I don't want to say necessarily I'm, you know, I have pride in my Christianity because, you know, what did I do to get it? You know, I just asked for it. I read, read the verse this morning. If we're going to glory, glory in the Lord. Why would we take pride in this country when it was God that blessed us, when it was God that gave us the freedom? And it is, it's all about proud to be an American. And then, you know, even in some of these songs, you know, talking about proud to be an American, you know, from the lakes of Minnesota to the hills of Tennessee, across the plains of Texas, from sea to shining sea. Well, who was it that made this country beautiful? It was God that made this country beautiful. Why don't we pray, praise the creator in songs like that? We don't, but we don't do that anymore. We used to, you know, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, of purple mountain majesty, above the beauty of fruit of plains, America, America, God shed his grace on thee. God was recognized in those songs back then, but somewhere along the lines, it changed and it's all American pride. And that pride, I believe, is leading us to destruction. I mean, now you'll get in more trouble. You won't get in trouble if you go into a church and you say, I'm proud to be an American. And even if you sing, I'm proud to be an American. And you know what? I hate to confess this, but you know what? It's out there. Our first service we had here, that song got sung. I'm embarrassed by that now. All right. You know, I believe the Lord's forgiven us, but I allowed that song to be sung here on our first service. And I am now embarrassed. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, but you know, it, it's out there. I, I, and there's no point in lying about it. Okay. Uh, it, it, it's out in cyberspace. It's out there for the world to see. Uh, very, very embarrassed by that. But you know what? That, that's, not, that's not the attitude we need to have. We need to be thankful. We need to thank God for this country. We need to thank God for all his blessings. But we're not doing that today. Now, I mean, you're not even supposed to mention that stuff. They're, you know, they don't want to mention him in politics. They're not allowed to mention him in the schools. But you can talk about national pride all you want. And, as, and I believe that that is going to lead us to destruction. I believe it's destroying us. And you can, you can sing about being proud to be an American... And you know, you won't get in trouble, but man, you know, you do you get in a lot of trouble if you start bashing this country too much. And I don't know what makes us think we shouldn't when you see how wicked this country's got, when you see how wicked 
our leaders are. And when you see, I'm sorry, how wicked our president is. I know he's a Republican and we're not supposed to say anything about Republicans. I know he's not Hillary, but it doesn't mean he's not wicked. All right? It's just, you know, uh, it's, it's just a fact. And we ought to be ashamed. I think we ought to be ashamed. But uh, pride, though, it got Sodom in trouble. They were proud of their country. Notice the next thing he said, pride. He says, fullness of bread. Genesis 13, verse 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Sodom at one time was a beautiful, well watered land. If you go there today, I've been there today, it is a nasty, disgusting, it, it's, it's where the Dead Sea is. The Dead Sea. Water that is, you know, so full of stuff that nothing can even live in it. It is, it is a dead place to this day where there's nothing growing. Everything's covered with salt and minerals and things. And, you know, but before that, it was a beautiful place. And notice though, one of the things that got that there, they're lifted up with pride. He mentions the pride and fullness of bread. Hey, look how blessed we are. Look how much food we have to eat. We're doing so good. And it got him lifted up with pride. But listen, why was Sodom such a prosperous place? It was because it was well watered. Well, who made Sodom? Who was it that made that city? Who was it that put the waters there and made the land the way it was? It was God that did that. One of the reasons we're so blessed in America is because this is a good land. All right. I mean, look at where we live. We are surrounded by food. I mean, cornfields everywhere. This is a very good land for growing food, which has helped make us a very prosperous country. Well, who made the land this way? This could be a desert, but it's not. It was God that created this land that we live in. And we do. We have fullness of bread here. God has blessed us greatly with food. I mean, one of our biggest struggles in America today is obesity. What are we going to do about obesity? Well, we could pray for a famine. <laughs> you know, I don't want to do that. But at the same time, that would solve one of our big problems. But you know, we do. We have we have fullness of bread. Deuteronomy chapter sixteen or six, verse ten says. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of good things which thou fillest not, and wells dig which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not. When thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You know what God said? You be careful when you get full you're going to forget me. And you know what? When is it when we usually get close to God? It's when we need him. When we're hungry. When we're in danger. When we're dependent on him. But sometimes God blesses us so much, we don't think about him anymore. And that's where we're at in America today. You know, when we go out you know, knocking doors, most of these people, they're not interested in the things of God. Why? Because they have everything they need. They've got plenty of food. They've got shelter and they've got the most important of all of these things is they've got a television set and internet. And if you have those things in America, why in the world would you need religion? And listen, there was a time when just having enough to eat and a place to live, if you had more than enough to eat, you were considered rich. Nowadays, if you don't have, you know, multiple cars and, you know, the latest and greatest cell phone, you're considered poor. But listen, having more than enough to eat is still rich. Okay, and we are very rich in this country, and it has caused us to forget the Lord. You know, I almost wonder sometimes if part of what caused the you know the whole custom and tradition of praying before a meal, if there was actually a time when people were thankful to be eating a meal. Because you know that it used to be that way, where people were just thankful to be eating a meal. But nowadays we think nothing of it. Nowadays you know, we go through drive through and if it takes more than five minutes, you know, we're losing our cool. And if they put cheese in our sandwich, we're losing our cool, you know, and, uh, you know, it, I should, I don't want to preach to myself tonight, but, you know, uh, but that, that, that's our attitude. That's how blessed we are in this country. I mean, we are, we are so blessed, 
you know, we've got to, you know, we're, and we're so spoiled. We've got to have things like microwaves, you know, to cook our food faster, you know, and the new Instapot my wife got a while back, you know, just everything's got to be fast and easy. You know, we don't even have to hardly work to eat. Why? Because we have fullness of bread in this country. God has blessed us and it has caused us to forget the Lord. And, you know, instead of just, man, you know, thank God, you know, what, you, know you would think we would, we would be thrilled every time we can just go and have a meal ready, just like that. You know, the fact that, you know, it, you know, food is so easy to come by in this country. You would think that would cause us to just praise the Lord like never before, but you know what? It's spoiled us. And we don't even think about these things anymore. And God is not in our thoughts. And we've, we, we're forgetting the Lord. And that is going on in our country. We've got pride. We've got fullness of bread. And because things are so easy in this country, because we are so stinking blessed, we have the third thing that he mentioned. And that's abundance of idleness. Look what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 9. Turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 9. And listen, I... I don't think there's even an argument that what that this is a problem today in America unlike it has ever been anywhere in all of history. I think we struggle with this. 1 Timothy uh, chapter 5, verse 9, Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man. Well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation, because they have cast off their first faith. Talking about bringing, you know, having uh, servants in the church who are women. You know, don't bring in the young ones, because, you know, you're going to get dependent on them, they're going to commit to these things, and then they're going to get bored, and then they're going to get married. You know, so it's, you know, the widows make sure they're at least 60. But then he said, this is what these younger widows are going to do. Verse 13, with all, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house. And not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies speaking things which they ought not. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully for some are already turned aside after Satan. We see here that it's talking about women here, ladies. So sorry, I'm going to talk about women, but women, if they don't have anything to do, they get themselves in trouble. Why? Because they're idle. They've got nothing to do. So what do they do? They go from house to house. Well, you know, Susie, why are you over here? I don't really have anything to do. So you got to come bearing news, you know, and then they, they start talking about stuff they shouldn't be talking about. And you know what the Bible says, you know what they need to do. The younger women just need to bear children. Why? If you're bearing children, you're going to have a hard time, you know, being idle. Okay. Because kids create a ton of work. You know, it's a blessing when they start getting older and they start, you know, accomplishing some things. But you know, when they're Lana's age, all right, you know, don't let that little ball of cuteness right there fool you. I mean, that's a lot of work. Uh, right there, you know, they, they create a great deal of work and it, but you know what? That work keeps us out of trouble. We were not meant to be idle six days. Shalt thou labor and do all that work. We're only supposed to have one day of rest. If we start having more than that, we're going to get idle. We're going to start looking for things to do. And what is it that's getting people in trouble, you know, in the cities right now, you know, you got all these gangster types, they go and they drop out of school, you know, and they're on welfare. So they're going to have plenty of food to eat. And so what do they do? They start walking the streets. You know, they're out hanging out at night with nothing to do. And what does it do? It gets them in trouble. And you know, one of the things that, you know, keeps me out of trouble, I don't have time to get in trouble. You know, I'm, I'm too busy. What is it that most of the crime and stuff goes on? It's at night. Well, what am I going to be doing at night? I'm sleeping because I'm tired. I'm not going to be out, you know, walking the streets at night. And if these people would get jobs, they wouldn't be doing that stuff, but they've got nothing to do. They're idle and it gets them in trouble. And there's abundance of idleness. Look at what's destroying the minds of people today. We spend hours and hours in front of the television, surfing the internet, you know, social media, all these things. I mean, just hours of idleness, idle time playing video games. I mean, just 
scrambling our brains, turning it into mush, and we wonder why we have the problems that we do in this country because we're just way too lazy. You know, back in the day, man, they were too busy working sun up till sundown. But because God has blessed us so much, because we have so much more than we need, we have plenty of time to just get stinking lazy. And as a, as a result of it, it's, it's hurting the character of people today. I believe one of the things that gets preachers in a lot of trouble, there, I, I, there are a lot of pastors that all they do, they, they don't do much. You know, they, a lot of, and listen, some preachers, man, they're busy. They, some pastors are the hardest working people in the world, but some of them are lazy. And these guys, they're full time. They don't go out and knock doors. They're not out making visits. Listen, I've talked to people here in town that went to churches that have pastors that are getting full-time salaries and the pastors won't visit anybody. I talked to one person that they, the pastor who gets a full-time salary and gets paid good, they were telling me how much he gets paid. And I'm thinking, you know, they, you know and they're looking for, they were looking for a pastor at that church. And I'm th- thinking, maybe I'll move over there. You know? No, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't do that. But listen, at that church, they're, they're paying him to do all this stuff. They only have services on Sundays and they had to have a meeting where they come together and they were trying, the pastor was trying to find somebody in the church who would volunteer to do hospital visits because he doesn't do hospital visits. And I'm thinking he does, he didn't go, he doesn't go door knocking. He doesn't do house visits. He doesn't do hospital visits. They have services only on Sunday. I'm thinking, what does he do all week? I mean, good night. Talk about paradise. And then, but you know, you hear these stories and then you hear about these preachers that turn into perverts. Well, listen, if you don't have anything to do, you're going to be more likely to sit around surfing the internet all day. And listen, I know of, I know of evangelists. I know of missionaries that have turned out to be perverts, you know, chatting with underage girls online. I mean, doing inappropriate things. And it's just like, in my mind, I'm thinking, where do these guys find the time to do this stuff? I'm, I said, I'm too busy to do, you know, even think of going down that route. But these guys, these, these guys aren't. Some of these evangelists, they don't, they don't go out soul winning. They're not knocking doors. They travel around. They're big shots. They show up at 7 o'clock at church. They preach till 8 Eight thirty, they're back at their hotel all day. The rest of that week, what are they, what are they doing all day? What are they doing all day? I know they're not preparing for their sermon because a lot of these guys preach the same sermons everywhere they go, and so it's like, what are they doing? They're obviously not studying their Bibles. I mean, listen to some of the things they preach, you know. And it's, I'm th- and then we find out these people get in trouble, and it's like. I wonder what, you know, it's called abundance of idleness, just doing nothing. I mean, sitting around on their phones all day, being big shots on the computer, you know, surfing the web, tweeting, all that stuff. And I, I'm t- I have no respect for that at all. Just absolutely no respect for these guys. I mean, it just, it makes me sick. And this abundance of idleness, it is a dangerous thing. Parents, even your young kids, you need to keep your kids busy. All right. When school's not, when you know, when school's not going on, they're not doing school during the summertime. You know, come up with some yard projects for them to do. You know, and I, I think you know my boys. They've been detasseling this year. I've got tons of yard work they need to do at the house. I haven't had them doing it this year because they have been working extremely hard detasseling, and I would prefer them do that because that actually brings in money, so they can pay for some of their own stuff. Uh, but now that detasseling is over, I'm going to be putting them on some of these projects and. Uh, they, uh, you know, they're not going to be getting paid. But anyway, no, I'll pay them. I'll pay them. I'm just going to start charging rent too, and I'll have them work it off that way. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kidding. But you know, it's good. For them. They need to be busy. Hey, you got to keep them busy, especially teenagers. That you can't just have them sitting around on their phone all day. You got to give them something to do. But at the same time, you know, you got these other, your parents too. They'll take every fun thing away from them without giving them anything that you, you can't expect them to just sit around reading their Bible all day either. You know, you've got to keep them busy. You've got to keep them active. You've got to keep them working. You've got to get them physically tired. 
And when you don't, you've got that abundance of idleness. And I believe that's one of the biggest things that leads to perversion because they do sit around internet all day long. And so, you know, they had pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness. And then they met, he mentions not helping the poor and needy, not helping the poor and needy, you know, not thinking about other people. You know what? That, that's that selfish mentality, that me first mentality. Psalms 10 two says the wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. You know, we, we need to be careful how we treat the poor. And listen, once again, in America, what's considered poor is not really poor. We don't really have a lot of poor people in our community. All right? And I don't believe welfare, the way it's set up today, is helping the poor. I think we're actually making it worse. We're making them more idle. I, I think what's going on is, is a lot worse, personally, or we're turning them into this. But Proverbs 21, 13 says, Whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself and shall not be heard. We need to understand how important it is that we have a mentality of others first. Thinking about other people. You know why people get themselves in trouble with morality and things like that? It's because they're thinking only of themselves. You know, any man, any preacher especially, you know, who's lazy, he's sitting around all day, surfing the internet, chatting with people he shouldn't chat, getting involved with perversion, that person is thinking 100% about themselves. They're not thinking about their wife. They're not thinking about their family. They're not thinking about their church. They're not thinking about anybody but themselves. Otherwise, they would never even think of doing something like that. But that's what happens when you get lifted up with pride. Hey, I'm a big shot now. I'm a full-time preacher. I've, you know, I've got stepped up into the ranks of the first class preachers who don't have to have a secular job. And, you know, I'm getting that full-time salary and I can sit around, be lazy, get fat, you know, do all those things that the, all the preachers are doing. You know, I've got the fullness of bread, stuff in my face. Everything's going good. And it, it does, I think it hurts the character. I mentioned that this morning. I think this is hurting the character. And that's why you see many pastors who are working full-time jobs are many times better pastors than these guys who are full-time. Because the one working full-time jobs, they actually have some character. And they're not idle. And these guys are idle. And it turns them into lazy, selfish perverts many times. Thinking only of themselves with this abundance of idleness they're not going to be helping the poor and needy. They're not thinking about the needs of the people in that church. They're not even thinking about the needs of the people in the hospital that could use a visit. They got to recruit somebody else in the church because they're just too lazy to get off their behind and get away from their computer to go make a visit and to go see how someone's doing. You know, they're not going to take the time to walk. I mean, you know, walk the streets and knock doors and things like that. I mean, you know what, folks, I'm telling you, it makes me so mad. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to out here that have never had a visit from their pastor. I've visited people in the hospital before that were just like friends, relatives, acquaintances of people in the church. And they'll talk about how their pastor has never visited them before in their life. They've never been to their house. They've never visited them in the hospital. And I don't say this, but I'm standing there thinking the whole time. And so why are you still going to that church? Why don't you go to the church of the guy who just came and visited you. I don't say that. I want to sometimes. But they do. But it's like they've been going to that church for 1,400 years, and so they're, just, they're going to die in that church. And, you know, the, you know, I think some of these churches where these preachers are just lazy, you know, they need to start getting hungry. So they'll, you know, it'll step up their game actually start doing something. Maybe it'll cause them to develop a little bit of character. Maybe if they're busy, they won't have time to sit around online turning themselves into perverts. But, we, but they're not. They're thinking about themselves and nobody else. And when you have that kind of attitude, it will destroy you. It will lead to greater sin. And then he mentions haughty. They were haughty. You know, just lifted up with pride. Look at Isaiah chapter 3, verse 9 says, The show of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. They, they declare their sin as Sodom. They're, they're haughty about it. 
You know, they're not only, not only are they wicked, you know, many people who are wicked, they at least try to hide it. They have the decency to try to hide it. They have the decency to try to cover it up. But you got some people that are so wicked that what do they do? They broadcast it. They show it off. Kind of like the whole gay pride thing. You know, they used to hide in a closet. They used to do behind closed doors. Now it's out in the open. They're haughty about it. And you know what? It, the same thing goes on even amongst Christians. Even amongst preachers. Listen, there are preachers out there. You know, this is why I'm not on Twitter. You know, my wife's on Twitter. And she'll show me some of these things sometimes. And I'll go on there and I'll look. And I'll just see these things. And it just irritates the snot out of me. But it's like, to me, if you are a pastor getting a full-time salary, you know, and you're hardly doing anything, you know, why would you broadcast that? Why would you, you know, if, if I spent most of my week golfing, I wouldn't be tweeting pictures of that. You know, I would at least try to hide it. <laughs> but it's like, they're haughty about it. You know, I mean, and it's like all these things, they, they're living these lives of luxury. I mean, they're living high on the hog and what do they do? They're, they're showing it off. You know, they're, they're, they're broadcasting it. They're not even ashamed of it. They're not even embarrassed at how lazy they are and how, and how little that they actually do. You know, they're not even embarrassed that they get up in church on Sunday morning They'll have, you know, two or three hundred people that come out to hear them preach, and it is crystal clear they probably didn't put 20 minutes of study into that message. Listen, as a preacher, somebody who puts messages together all the time, I can tell when somebody just threw something together and when they actually put some study into it. It's real easy to tell, and you can probably tell too. I mean, you've, if you've sat and listened enough preaching, you can tell when a guy just found a verse. Oh, I like that verse. And then he goes and he reads that verse, and then the rest of it's just telling stories. Just tell. You know why he's doing that? You know he's he's got to fill the time. It's like you know, have you ever worked with those people that they work those hourly jobs, and so I was just watching the clock, you know, trying to look busy while they're just waiting out the clock, and it's like that's what they're doing. You know, well, let me tell you another story. You know, they're looking at the clock back there. You know, I got another ten minutes. All right, this one will probably take about five minutes. You know, and they'll they'll tell those stories. It's just. Man, you know, people drove a long way to come hear this message. You're getting paid. You're getting your double honor that you're supposed to be getting. And it's crystal clear you put hardly any thought into this message at all. Listen, I heard about one guy. He went and the pastor was preaching something and he just he knew something was weird. He went and kind of Googled some of the things he was saying and literally found the guy's outline right there online. All the same verses, the same points, the same illustrations. This preacher went online and just found a message and just preached it like it was his own. You know how easy that is? That, that, you know how easy? To, I, don't, I think that's real easy to just take someone else's outline and preach it. You know, I've, I've been doing this long enough. You could, you could, you could give me an outline and you can hand it to me right before service, and I, I could get up and preach it like I'd studied for it. I could do that, but you know what? I refuse to do that. I refuse to get my messages off the internet. You know, I, I'm, I, I have enough respect for what you all do that I'm not going to waste your time like that. But they do it. You know, they, they broadcast their laziness, and they're they're haughty about it. They're still proud of it. Doesn't even bother them. You know, I've preached plenty of messages before where, you know, I'd put some study into it and everything, but it was like, you know, I probably should have worked a little harder on that one. You know, it, I've had the messages before that were just kind of, I felt like it was just a total flop. That man, that one failed. And you know what? That bothers me when that happens. And it's like, do I even want to put this sermon online? It wasn't very good at all. <laughs> you know, and I just, I'm kind of, I, I'm, I've had those before where I'm just embarrassed by it. But when that happens, you know, it, it causes me to want to work a little harder on the next one. You know what? My, people in my church, they deserve, they deserve better than that. And, you know, and the, and the fact that people can just do this over and that over and over again and it not bother them and then to still be haughty, I think, I think it's disgusting personally. And that's how it was in Sodom. They've got all these things going their way. 
you know, they're haughty about it. And then the last thing it mentions, it mentions how they committed abominations. Look what it says in Jude 1, 7. It says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of, of eternal fire. So we see they did, they finally, after it was all said and done, after all these things, after this progression, they gave themselves over to abomination. So listen, when you hear, you know, Pastor Trendy out there who, don't, who wants to take it easy on the homos, you know, using Ezekiel chapter 16, saying, you know, pride's a bigger sin than homosexuality, you know, that, no, that's not what this is saying. This is what leads to those things. And do you not see how all these things, are in our country today, the national pride, when we have nothing to be proud of, the fullness of bread, the abundance of idleness. I mean, just the amount of TV shows, the amount of channels that are out there, the amount of stuff that's on the internet. I mean, have you ever, I've seen it before too, where, you know, I'll hear about some video, it's gone viral and you'll look and it's like got, you know, 10 zillion views. And you'll, and I'll, you'll watch it. And it was just like, that was so stupid in such a huge waste of time. I will never get that five minutes back. And then you look and you see, you know, it's been watched a hundred million times. And you're just like, our country is in terrible shape. <laughs> that, you know, that we have that much time to, uh, you know, just watch all this absolute stupidity. These reality shows that they keep coming out with more and more reality shows, the talk shows. I mean, how many more times, you know, are people going to be, you know, are they going to want to watch some, you know, scumbags get up there trying to figure out who the father is of some kid? You know, how many times do we need to see that kind of stuff? But yeah, they keep doing it because we're so stinking idle. You know, we're selfish. We only think about ourselves and we're haughty, we're still, we're still proud of these things. We broadcast it, we display it, and we, we, don't, e- we don't even care. It doesn't even cost to be ashamed. And you know what? Fine, we are. We're there in this country. Abominations all over the place. Committing abominations. It's becoming like Sodom and Gomorrah in America. And listen, that type of sin, it's, it's not a natural thing. These are not like the works of the flesh. This is unnatural stuff that happens. And it's because we give ourselves over to these things. And eventually, you know, normal sins aren't going to satisfy anymore. You're going to go into deep perversion. But that stuff doesn't happen overnight. Nobody just decides one day that I'm going to start doing all these horrific things that people do. It's a progression. And it starts with it starts with that pride. Pride is a huge sin, folks. Pride is a big deal. Pride is what got the devil in trouble. Pride has gotten all of us in trouble. But you all understand, while we've all committed the sin of pride, if we can, you know, humble ourselves, it will keep us from ever getting into things, you know, like homosexuality and stuff like that. It is. It's a progression. And so, what we can learn from the iniquity of Sodom as described by Ezekiel, is that we have to remember one sin always leads to another sin. And it's it's always a greater sin. James 1.14 says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Okay, You don't sin first, you lust first, and then it when it's conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Sin, one sin always leads to another sin. And so we, we've got to remember that. You might think this isn't a big deal. Well, that sin's not a big deal, but the next one is a big deal. And it has severe consequences. We need to realize that the sins that are mentioned here are the ones, many times, though, without realizing it. Do you realize these sins that we mentioned are what we are pursuing. So, well, I'm not pursuing these things. Well, listen, why is it so important that we wear the clothes we wear, drive the cars that we drive, live in the houses that we live in? Is it because these things meet our needs or is it to impress other people? Well, if it's to impress other people, that's a pride problem, isn't it? 
I just like to make a little more money so I can have nicer things. Why? So you can lift yourself up with pride? That's what people, that people without even realizing, it, that's many times what we're going for. That's why we're not satisfied because we're trying to lift ourselves up with pride. Fullness of bread. I just, I, you know, I just want more. I want more. I don't have enough. You know, and we're trying to, you know, we should just be saying, give us this day our daily bread. But, you know, we, we don't, we don't, we're not just trying to get our needs provided for. We're trying to get all our lust provided for. You know, that abundance of idleness. I just wish I had more time to relax. Well, listen, sometimes okay. But, you know, we all love vacations, don't we? And I'm all for taking vacations. I think it's good to take vacation. But you know what? If your whole life's a vacation, you're going to get in trouble. And that's what a lot of people are shooting for. I just, you know, I want to have more time so I can be lazy. Listen, if you want to have more time, so, you know, from, from your, off from your job so you can do more work for the Lord, then go for it. But you always need to keep busy. It is, it's healthy keeping busy. Many people, when they retire, they end up dying a few years later. You know why? Because they get so stinking lazy and it's bad for their health and ends up killing them. That's why a lot of retired people, you know, they do, they make sure they keep busy. Because it is, it, it's healthy. But we are, many times, we're, we're actually trying to get idle. You know, sometimes I think that way too, man. You know, it'd just be nice to just someday not have anything to do. To just wake up one morning and think, I have nothing to do today. That would be, be a great feeling. But, you know, and that's okay to shoot for that for one day, but not all the time. But we're shooting for those things. You know, what are we doing with all these things we're pursuing? We're thinking about ourselves instead of thinking about other people. Thinking about our own needs instead of the needs of our friends and our neighbors and our church. And we are, you know, we're haughty. We, you know, we do. We want to look good. We want to, you know, we want to be able to strut around like a peacock. You know, we want to be able to just, you know, be proud. And I don't think any of us will admit, you know, we're trying to commit abominations. I don't think any of us are shooting for committing abominations, but you all understand these things that people are pursuing, the things we're pursuing in this country are the things that ultimately end up getting people in trouble to where they're doing abominations. And so uh, we need to, we need to watch out for that. And so it's very important for us as Christians to make sure we stay humble and keep busy. And it is important that we remain dependent on God. I just wish I could win the lottery so I just wouldn't have to worry about money anymore. Well, you know what? You need to worry about money because you need to be dependent on God. You know, you, got, you need to be, you need to keep praying. God wants you to keep trusting Him. If all of a sudden we had a ton of money in this church, then I don't need to worry as much about doing everything like God wants so I can have His blessing. You know, but what is, God wants us dependent on Him. God wants us searching the Scriptures and trying to figure out what we can do to please Him. And so we, you know, what, what God Israel, every time we talked about this morning in Sunday school, God would bless them. They would get relaxed and then they'd get in trouble every time. And so we've got to remain, we've got to make sure we remain intense when it comes to serving God. Don't let up. Don't get lazy. Listen, if God keeps blessing here, if we start having a full house all the time, that is not the time for us to say, all right, we filled the place up. You know, let, we can, let's, let's back off on the soul winning. You know, let, we don't need to work as hard anymore. Let's just enjoy what we have. That is not the attitude we need to have. You know what we need to do when things fill up around here? We need to, all right, how can we do more? We, we just need to keep going. We need to remain intense. If we don't, we will get in trouble. And that is what got Sodom in trouble it didn't start with the homosexuality. It started with the pride and it led from one sin to another. And we are seeing this in our own country. We've seen it in churches. We've seen it in individuals. We've got to make sure we keep this out of our lives. And so with that, let's all stand together.